Oui. Euh... stuff. Good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon session. I know it's always difficult to get people coming in after, after lunch. People are engaged in conversations and um, make it difficult to get the audience back in the room. But I guess that we should start. Um, my name is Emil Frison. I am the chair of the International Scientific Committee of the Daniela Nina Carasso Foundation, uh, which is uh, supporting this uh, session. And before I start, I want to say just a few words about the foundation. The Daniel and Nina Carasso Foundation is a family foundation established in 2010 and which has chosen sustainable food systems as its main area of uh, interest and support in order to advance uh, and uh, make progress in the transformation of our, of our food systems. The first activity of the foundation in the area of sustainable food systems was the establishment of a prize, the Premio Daniel Carasso, and I will say more about it uh, in uh, the second part of this session. But besides uh, the uh, Premio, there are a number of activities supported by the Foundation in terms of on-the-ground projects that aim to transform the uh, food systems towards more sustainable food systems. It supports research 
and it supports advocacy. Uh, and uh, the latter part, for example, through the support to the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, of which both uh, Hans Herren, who will be introduced in a minute, and myself are also members, but also, for example, through the support to this uh, conference here. So the, uh, the reason to support this conference is really to encourage the people involved in food security to think more in terms of food systems all the way from before the production of inputs until uh, the after consumption and, and the, the, the waste management and to look at the multiple dimensions of sustainable food systems. And what we mean by that is food systems that are not only economically vibrant, but also environmentally sustainable, that provide for good nutrition and health, that are socially equitable and culturally appropriate. And it's very important uh, to the foundation and to people working in sustainable food systems that we always keep these multiple dimensions in mind and not just looking at improving the economic dimension, which is what happens most of the time, but also pay equal attention to the nutritional, environmental, social and cultural dimensions. At the last uh, global conference on food security in Cornell, the foundation already supported a symposium, and on that occasion, uh, it inaugurated an MS Swaminathan lecture. Uh, the first lecture was given by Professor Swaminathan himself, and this was as an illustration of somebody that started as one of the fathers of the Green Revolution and really worked at improving productivity of rice. Uh, but over his career really evolved towards thinking about sustainable food systems, paying really attention to the nutrition aspect, to the environmental aspect, to the social aspects, and uh, has, for example, been um, doing a lot of work with his foundation on uh, a lot of the minor uh, neglected and underutilized species that are extremely important for the nutritional uh, quality of, of the diet. So uh, this year, the uh, Swaminathan lecture will be delivered by Dr. Hans Herren. Uh, I think uh, Hans doesn't need much in the way of introduction to this audience. Uh, he has uh, been recognized on many occasions, and I will just say the two main uh, responsibilities that uh, he has today, one as the president of the BioVision Foundation and as the head of the Millennium Institute uh, in Washington. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I want to uh, invite Dr. Hans Herren to deliver the MS Swaminathan lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. Thank you, the Carasso Foundation, for the invitation. I'm very honored to be, uh, have been invited to give the uh, eight, uh, MS Swaminathan lecture. Uh, Swaminathan, or Swami, as he is known among the friends, is a very good friend of mine, and as you know, the first laureate of the World Food Prize. So, uh, I was asked to say a few words about what agriculture is needed for sustainable food systems. And um, again, I see agriculture really as part of the food system. So sometimes I don't know why we actually see agriculture and the food system, because actually it's all in one. But I guess we need to make the point a bit better. So what is wrong with our food system? That's maybe we need to figure out to know what the problems are so that we can also find the solutions. Because too often we have solutions looking for a problem and then we missed the boat. And we have done that for the last, what, 50 years or more, uh, I think, in agriculture and our food systems. So we still have this triple burden uh, of malnutrition, the hunger, micronutrient deficiencies, obesity, diabetes, non-communicable diseases, and all on the rise, as you know. It actually will bankrupt governments in a few years from now unless we do something really, really uh, uh, decisive. We have an agriculture which is uh, environmentally unsustainable, loss of biodiversity, 
We have pollutions of all sorts, water, water tables with insecticides, pesticides of all sorts. Um, we have land degradation, we have killing all the life in the soil, making deserts left and right. We have a problem with climate change, we contribute to CO2 instead of actually being, uh, being the solution to climate change. And also, uh, an agriculture has extremely low resilience. I think that's actually one of the big problems we need to be able to solve. So how can we increase resilience? Then let's look a little bit at the social uh, side of things. Again, uh, poverty remains a major problem in agriculture. All our, our farmers, most of them are poor, if not, if not bankrupt. And you can go, doesn't matter where you look, the farmers are basically always the one at the lowest scale in the society. Whenever, when actually what they do is produce the, pro, pro, produce the food we all need several times a day. So I think we have a problem there also of understanding you know, the, the value of our uh, farmers and make sure they know that we give them the respect they deserve and that is actually by paying the right price for the food. And also neglect for cultural values, you can go wherever you want to, it's the same uh, McDonald's and others. Uh, you know, that also something we need to uh, deal with uh, seriously in the years to come. And you don't, in the background there, I just have sort of a very slight, uh, not the definition, but the picture of a food system. It is extremely complicated, and now more and more people actually try to sort out on what's going on. But that's something I don't want to go into the details right now. But, you know, what is wrong? We have said this already years ago, and now we come back with this thing every time I give a talk because we need to remind people that 400 people have worked four years for a report which in 2008, 2009 when it got published, said that we need to change. We need not a little change, we need a big change, a transformation, not messing about the corners of our system like we still do today. It's a systemic change, a paradigm change we, we need. But again, that has not really uh, gone very far, except, and I will tell you later, where we can find it. So, if you look at agriculture, you go back maybe uh, 60, 70 years back, we had an agriculture which was actually supported by ecosystem services. All right, if you can look down at the bottom, and what you have, uh, no pointer here. Um, anyway, the, the little bottom land there next to the zebra, well, we have, you know, nature. We have pollination, we have pest, pest control, all actually part of ecosystem services. Nutrient cycling, water cycling, that all happen in healthy soils. So that was there. We also had farmers who actually were um, working, not just driving a machine remote control. But we don't make any money with that. So we decided to change this whole thing and try to sell, make, make money at the cost of the farmers, cost of the environment, at the cost of almost everything. Also the consumer at the, in the end of the day is paying. So we replaced it with large scale irrigation, with pesticide, herbicides, uh, uh, hybrid seeds and GMOs. And what happened? That nice green agriculture, which was actually resilient, it was also productive, um, has been turned into what this black uh, picture there. And even the consumer, as you saw, is now upside down. So this is a little bit what we've done with our environment. Try to go to Europe in the spring, it's all yellow everywhere. Uh, or you can go in the, in the Middle West or in Brazil, you see uh, harvesting machines as far as you can see. I mean, this is the type of environment we, we can't continue. We know that, we said so. The dark clouds are coming, and I think what we need really is something different. We need a, a, a landscape where everybody has a place. And the quotation of the day, December, 5, December 5th, you all know that study done in Europe on, on, on insect dying. In, in what, three decades, 75% reduction. Now, how long are we gonna just look at this and do nothing? Continue spraying, continue monoculture. So we need to change this. We need to do something. And, we, and why, so we continue to produce too much Double the needed food is produced today, global scale, double. And then what do we do? We waste it, we lose it, because it's so cheap, who cares? So we know that. So finally, some action is starting on the food waste, but we have not really started really rethink our food system, the production side of it. And again, from conventional 
industrial agriculture, we need to move over to regenerative, ecological, organic, name it, uh, permaculture. There's many, many options there in sustainable agriculture. One there is not is climate smart agriculture, because that's still green evolution 3.0, reductionist approach. We need a, a systemic and holistic approach to agriculture. But, you know, so we, we need to do something here. We need to change the way we consume. If you don't change consumption, you cannot change production. And it's because our consumption patterns have actually induced the change in agriculture in a direction we don't want. So it is a circular issue, and we need to deal with it. We need a different pathway altogether. So even the subsistence agriculture, some of the more traditional one, needs to move just as the industrial one, into something what we call a diversified agroecological farming. So we need to move, we need to change this, and we know, so this is out of the report from IPS Food, uh, where actually my good friend uh, Emil Frison was the uh, lead author of this uh, paper, published to 2016. I hope you have read it. Uh, if not, uh, just go download it, it's available. Now, we will go hungry. You hear all the time. You can read it almost every other day. If we go organic, if we go agroecological, we're all going to starve to death. Scaremongering. The data are there. You can see them for yourself on the screen. We know we can do it. And if in the West we produce 10% less or 8, who cares? We're throwing away 40%. Let's do it right. And in developing countries, look at there. We can easily almost double. And I spent 30 years in Africa. Agadol is not doubling, it's trebling. We can do that right now. What are we waiting for? A lot of research has been done. Examples of agroforestry system, for, you know, which are resilient, and we need more resilience. We need mixed cropping. You can do that at any scale. It's only for, not only for the smallholder farmer. It is for everybody. And we need to make sure that all farmers are changing. And you go to the US right now, you can see farmers are so fed up that to pay all this money to Monsanto, to the Pioneer and others, they actually come up with new ideas on how to do things. And it works. They can do it. So if they can do it, if we have organic farmers who are making it in this world, nobody should tell me it cannot be done. If not, there wouldn't be a single organic, a single uh, agroecological farmer around, right? If it's not possible. And here, um, again, we'll have a, a system which is complex, which uh, was developed actually in the center in Africa, in Nairobi, where we mix cereal crops, could be sorghum, could be rice, could be maize. Maize, we shouldn't have too many. We heard that before. I, um, I agree with this. But these are systems where, where we use the, the qualities of the plants, the characteristics of the farmers' selected plants, and they can deal with it. Can you get this thing going there? Anyway, there's a, okay, ah, here we go. So this little film shows, you know, how basically in such a system you can deal with the weeds, you can deal with the insects who are uh, repelled out of the field into a trap crop. We can, you can see this here. So plants have all the kind of characteristics which we need to actually harness for our benefit. We don't know if to spray anything out there. This type of system out yields the best hybrid with local farmers varieties. And why? It's because the plants can do this. But the soil is the thing. We need to rebuild the life in the soils. And so you have the system working. So even the weeds are going, as you can see here. And what do we do? We take carbon in the ground because we have now permanent cover. We have a good water uh, 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 cycling. And we don't need any nitrogen fertilizer because the plants, those cover plants, actually bring it in there. Enough for the whole crop. It works. Yields trebled, quadrupled. And you can read it. There's science articles about it. So just to say we can if we want. Again, yesterday, December 2, soil power, the dirty way to a green planet. Check for this article in the New York Times. Amazing. We can get a lot of carbon from up there into the ground. Draw down the carbon. That's what's going to save us. But not the agriculture which is doing right now. The one which is still promoted by most donor agencies by uh, large donors. No, we need to change. We know how to do it. Very good article, uh, just can see, look at it. And if we do things right, we get one and one is not two. 
one and one is three or four or five. So we need to start to pull things together in our fields. And then you can see that you get synergic effect. And here in Copper Capita, you can see how much you, synergy effects you get there. I mean, you don't get this from monocrop. No, we know how. This is science. This is science-based agriculture. Modern, the agriculture of the future, called agroecology, call it organic, call it permaculture, but this is what can be done. And why? It's because we put together the elements of what we do, the economy, society, and environment, all in one, not separate. And if we do that, our agriculture will get green again. And not only are we neutral, we can actually take down carbon, and we have to. We are at 405 ppm CO2. You know what scientists say? We should be at 208, not even 285, at 208. Now you tell me how we're going to do that if it's not the farmers of the future will do it. And that future is right now. It starts right now. So we know all this. Nothing is happening, right? And why? Because the political economy and we have a bunch of lock-ins. So we have these problems, these lock-ins, which again are out of this report, which Emil was coordinating, uh, IPES Food 2016. And you know, we are stuck in the old system. Our policymakers are stuck in this system. We need to get them out. And your job as scientists is also to go and start to say more systemic work. Get this thing out. So, in an agriculture with the export oriented, everyone in this planet wants to be exporting food and feeding the world. No, take care of your own people with good, uh, uh, nutritious food. Nobody has any business. Okay, maybe uh, Dubai and Singapore need to import their food. But almost everybody else, if you want to, you can do. So localize the food system. Stop this idea of export orientation. We are path dependent. Oh, because we know the way to do it so far, we just continue. It's maybe a risky business to change, but still, you know, we need to actually take, make, take the risk. What is success? Yield per hectare. I went to some talks here. It's still more yield, please. We, 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 are, we are not done with that. We need to change the metrics. Our indicators are wrong. That's why we continue in the wrong direction. Short-term thinking. Again, you know, maybe you think next season, ah, probably not, not even. Our politicians, decision makers, everything is short-term. Agriculture doesn't work in the short-term. It is the medium and long-term, generation time. Destroy the soil in one year or two, it takes you 20 to rebuild it. This is what the issues we are dealing with. Uh, feed the world narrative, exactly, export, and the expectation of cheap food. This, I think, is the, the, the biggest problem we have. And this is promoted by a lot of the companies who are there who process our food. Oh, it has to be cheap. And politicians like that, because when it's cheap, uh, then um, you don't have any riots in the street, right? Never mind how good or bad it is how full of residue it is, how much land has been destroyed behind it, how many farmers have gone broke, that doesn't really matter, as long as it's cheap. So we all have to start to think about paying more for our food. Because if we pay more, the poor people, the poor farmer will have more money, so they get out of poverty. And we can do it. And again, uh, I don't have much time to go, go into these details here, but in that paper, in that uh, um, article, you can find all we you know, sort of what is recommended to actually get out of these lock-ins. But a big one, really, is to turn our back to big agribusiness. They are destroying all our farmers, they are destroying our health, uh, they're destroying our economic system. And that's why I think we need really to think about, you know, sort of how do we move forward? We have to change. We have been saying this in 2008. If we don't, all right, I mean, I won't really suffer too much because I'll go on almost, but a lot of the young people here have to start to think about. And it is really in your hands to make sure that we do something different. Now, guess what? Ha! We actually have a framework. Since uh, two years back, when the, the global community decided that we can, that, that we, we decided on the sustainable development goals, universal, they're for everybody, they're not only for the developing countries, um, we have a framework, so we don't have to argue over the, the, do we have the policy framework? Yeah, we have it. Now let's do it. And if you start to unpack what's there in goal two, which connects to every other 
a, a goal in, in the system. I mean, you can say that for every other one, but let's, because we talk food, we are taking two. And we hear that later on about 2 and 11, right? So um, we, we need to use that. And what's interesting is that a lot of the um, recommendations which came out of the, or which were done in the IASTD report, which I mentioned before, actually have found their, their way in there. Because more than 150 NGOs, not the government, NGOs have said, look, we need to now build this into somewhere. And they are in there. A lot about sustainable agriculture, sustainable food systems. So we need to use this framework. And we have it now, so let's use it. But what happened? Governments, when they see, oh my God, like 17 goals, 169 target, 242 uh, indicators, they, they get paralyzed. We don't have to get paralyzed because it's not that complicated. We have modern tools today actually to do the job. But again, you know, people rather lay, lay back, oh my God, I cannot do it, it's too complicated. And we have now already a number of initiatives, and I just want to point the Cat pour Mille, which again was discussed in the COP23 in Bonn. And now, finally, I think we are moving. I started COP21, 22, nothing really happened. 23, now I think we are back on track with a number of workshops planned for next year on actually transforming agriculture, agroecology. That's the way to go, and I think we are really something uh, uh, very strong there. But, you know, there's other organizations which talk about things and they, don't, they do something different. And in Africa today, the research, a lot of the money from banks and, and uh, donors are still supporting the wrong agriculture. They are still dreaming of this green evolution which they never got. Let's move on, eh? let's move on, guys. We don't have time. And certainly, you don't have time uh, for waiting. And everybody needs to do something. And I hope you noticed in the plate there, there was a little bit of orange uh, sweet potato. And again, I think Albert Einstein said it already. You cannot solve the problem with the same kind of thinking that created it. And this is still for many who are stuck in this old paradigm. So get, let's get out of it now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Hans, for keeping to time first, and uh, second, for a very thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, we will have questions at the end of the two presentations. So I uh, will now introduce the, the second talk. And this is the uh, keynote lecture that will be given by the winner of the 2017 Premio Daniel Carasso. The uh, Daniel Carasso Prize is an international prize intended to reward an outstanding researcher that has developed high-level research with impact on sustainable food systems. It intends to give him or her, in this case, more visibility and to help inspire junior scientists to uh, develop transdisciplinary approaches to study food systems and their sustainability. The uh, first prize, which was given in 2012, uh, was given to Jessica Fanzo, uh, who has, is present here also in, in this conference. Uh, and in 2015, we had the second prize that was given to Tara Garnett from the Food and Climate uh, Research Network. And this year, we have the privilege to have with us here Jane uh, Battersby, uh, the winner of the 2017 prize. Uh, Jane uh, is the leader of the urban food cluster at the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town. Uh, she's an urban planner, uh, an urban geographer by training. She works across a range of food security, food system, and food governance projects in Africa. She is currently coordinating uh, the Consuming Urban Poverty Project and leads the Nourishing Spaces, Spaces Project, both of which seek to use food in various ways to understand and alleviate urban poverty and inequality. 
And I, I think it's very appropriate, uh, having had a first talk dealing more on the production side, to have a second talk about food systems that is more dealing with the consumption side and with the urban population. So without further ado, I invite Jane uh, to deliver her keynote. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to invite you to Cape Town. I'm not sure if they gave me the prize because they knew the conference was going to be in Cape Town, so or if it's just serendipity. But here I am to talk about towards an urban food security agenda. And like um, Emil said, I, I work on urban food security issues, urban food systems, and urban governance. And there's been quite a silence on the urban question in this conference. And I think part of it is we've got this legacy of thinking about Africa as a place that's both rural and hungry, and yet time and time again, and you'll have seen some of these figures, you know, we are the fastest urbanizing region in the world. South Africa is 64% urban. Africa as a whole will be 50% urban by 2050. Not all of that urbanity is in, in mega cities, so the fastest growth is in smaller secondary cities, and we need to think about what that might mean for, for food security and food systems. There's increasing evidence of urban food insecurity. We've got rapidly changing manifestations. It's no longer simply about hunger. We're increasingly seeing what we've heard time and time again, the triple burden, um, undernutrition, micronutrient deficiency, and obesity in the same neighborhoods, in the same households. And so just some, some flash figures. I'm gonna show a few images from, from South Africa just to ground where we're talking about. So in South Africa, again, this notion that food insecurity is a, a rural phenomenon is something that really dominates policy and research, and yet, large-scale national data indicate that the levels of food insecurity in, in low-income urban areas are highly comparable to those in lower-income rural areas. And so if this is the case, and we're more than 60% urban already, why are we still focusing predominantly on rural areas and rural kinds of solutions? The latest demographic and health survey shows that in South Africa, 68% of women, 31% of men are obese, that obesity is concentrating in, in our cities, but at the same time, we've got pers persistent stunting. So this is evidence of a food system that's really not delivering, a just food, uh, uh, delivering just food security and food systems for people. And so it suggests that, well, business as usual with a food system is not working. And yet also solutions as usual are not working. The kinds of policy, the kinds of programmatic responses, the kinds of NGO responses we're seeing are not shifting that persistent um, stunting and are nothing, doing nothing to address the, the rising obesity. So we need to think about new kinds of solutions and new kinds of ways of doing research and engaging with civil society. So in the urban context, and I think this probably applies beyond the urban, but I'm speaking from my point of experience, we've done this analysis and we found urban food insecurity. And because we focused the analysis at the household scale, all the interventions have therefore been household scale interventions. Nutrition education for individuals, uh, school feeding, um, promotion of, of food gardens, all interventions at the household scale. And I don't think that's really gonna cut it um, for some of the reasons that Hans has been talking about. So again, to take a deep dive back into some data, this is work we did in Cape Town back in 2008 in low income areas of the city, just showing the limited diet diversity that we saw. The average dietary diversity was six out of 12, um, the proxy for malnutrition is six. So we're looking at a, a nutritionally poor environment. Again, you can see the concentration of starch-based carbohydrates, concentration of foods made with oil, fats, and butter, foods made with sugar. This is a nutrient-poor, calorie-dense food that the food system is being provided. This is what it looks like in reality. Now, it's into this kind of space that the policy, policy solutions that we see are trying to get people to grow vegetables, to supplement their diets, or trying to give nutrition education to tell people what they should be consuming. The question is, is that really sufficient? Is that gonna shift these patterns that we're seeing? So we started to look a little bit more, stepping out from the household and looking about how households occupy a food system and how households occupy an urban system. So you can see, firstly, the very small proportion of households that were growing any of their own food. So that urban agriculture is the solution, didn't seem to be the obvious solution to the poor. But then you see the presence of the supermarket and how almost all households were accessing the supermarket, but on a day-to-day -day basis, people are navigating that informal sector. 
which is often seen as delivering worse quality foods, having problems of food safety, being more expensive. So if it's got all those challenges, why are people still doing that? And so this starts to ask these questions about how people are living and moving and have they, having their being in the food system. <coughs> So we started thinking about, well, what's driving the food system that we're seeing, and where are new potential spaces for intervention? So one of the things we did was we mapped the expansion of the supermarkets in, in Cape Town. So this is a map of Cape Town. For those of you who are visitors, we, we overlaid it onto census data, census income data. And the wealthier areas, the dark brown areas, the poorer areas, the light brown areas. And you can see each green dot represents where a supermarket was. You can see an explosion of supermarkets in the last 20 years in, in Cape Town. And each of those supermarkets is, is predominantly in a shopping mall, which then comes with two fast food joints associated with it. So you're seeing a rapid, rapid shift in a food system. And it's because decisions are being made about food without a food mentality. So when you talk to the urban planners in the city, they don't see the expansion of supermarkets as a food issue. They see it as a local economic development issue. So suddenly there's a need to think about, well, what is the role of urban planning in shaping people's dietary opportunities? sort of shift down a scale to neighborhood scale. And this is a map of informal food retail is in just one neighborhood. And you can see there's this plethora of food retail happening. And it's got these interesting spatial dynamics. If I had a pointer, I'd point, but I'll just try and do this. In the bottom middle section of the map, you can see there's immense density of food retail. What's happening there, that is where the train station is. And so you think about the long commutes that people have and how they navigate the food system. Think about how food then starts to integrate with these other spatial functions like transport, like sanitation, like water. And so if you're going to start shifting what's getting sold, if you're just going to start shifting what people are eating, then you've got to start thinking about how it intersects with all these kinds of things. We've also got to be careful of, of just simply valorizing the informal sector, because this is a, an image we got from Epworth in Zimbabwe just last year of an informal trader. And you can see there's fresh produce there, but it's getting crowded out by highly processed foods. And so we again need to shift to another scale and think about what's happening at the global scale. And so this is um, David Sanders, you'll recognize this graph, um, just showing the, the, the rapid increase in the importation of snack foods and soft drinks into South Africa and into the SADC region. And so David often says that our, our trade policies in South Africa are entirely at odds with our health policies and our food security policies. And so we need to think about, well, what is it then that happens at the local scale, the neighborhood scale, the city scale, the national and the global scales that are all shaping people's consumption, which moves us away from these old approaches about thinking about food security at the household scale and the interventions then being at the household scale. Your scale of analysis and your scale of, of policy do not need to match. So we now have this new possibility of saying, well, actually, household food insecurity is shaped by household characteristics characteristics of the food system, characteristics of the urban system, and megatrends. And if we start to frame them all in this common understanding of a food system impacted by other, food, by other systems, well, then it opens up a, a whole different set of interventions. And I think this is where there's a potentially an exciting space, because now there's a new intervention space. So how do we get there? The first thing is I think we need to transcend disciplinary boundaries. That's not saying we all need to be transdisciplinary researchers. I mean, it's hard enough to just try and be in one discipline. But we need to be able to speak knowledgeably across disciplines because policymakers are not bound by disciplines. And so, you know, one of the things we've done within the African Center for Cities is to recognize that we all hold particular kinds of knowledges. And if you're going to speak to policymakers, you need to be able to speak across those things. So we've set up a series of, of what we're calling 101s. So if you need to speak to a policymaker, what do you need to know in order that you don't look like an idiot? So we've done 101s on spatial planning, done 101s on, on land, 101s on um, municipal finance, just trying to broaden our, our discipline knowledge and so we know who we need to speak to in order to, to sound knowledgeable, even if we're not. The second point is about data. As Hansa said, you know, data is generated for particular purposes. When you try and repurpose it, you end up with problems. It's a bit like um, trying to eat soup with a fork. You can do it, but it's going to be messy and you're going to lose a whole lot of the richness of the soup. We need to find new ways of doing data. So we need to repurpose the old data. We need to think about, well, how do you disaggregate it differently so it's more meaningful? How do you liberate it from private sector who don't, don't share their data? So how do you make the most of what's there? But what other kinds of new data do you need? What are the stories that aren't getting told with the data that we have? 
And so thinking about how, well, how do you fund those projects is the, the next challenge. But how do we think differently about research? How do we think differently about data? How do we make sure it's collaborative? Because I think it's only in collaboration that we can start to have, have real meaning. It's about development of capacity. It's about developing new forms of researchers who are able to, to think at the systems level, but also developing policymakers who are able to think beyond their policy silos, civil society who are able to engage the food system, and thinking about what is the role of us as, as researchers, as boundary agents, as institutional memory, as connectors across these systems. And then thinking about new forms of engagement. Because what we realized is dissemination isn't just about giving a report at the end. It's not about publishing a paper and hoping a policymaker picks it up. It's not even about doing a policy brief. It's about including those policymakers in the process from the inception of the project onwards. And so just a few models of what, what we've tried to do. Um, and there are lots of other things out there. But these are just some of the things that we've tried to do. Um, we've established a series of city, city labs basically where you pull together civil society, policymakers, business, academia, into a safe space. Oftentimes we, we just get on a bus because getting out of a room like this is actually the way in which you generate conversation. And you build trust over a few years. And that slowly, slowly starts to shift things. Another thing we've done is we've had embedded researchers, which is where we take researchers from the university, normally junior researchers, and literally embed them within policymaking spaces. So we've had... Um, people embedded in the city of Cape Town, in Lusaka, et cetera, and they work within the city to try and understand how those processes happen, see how they, their research can be useful, but also what it is we can understand about how their systems work, so that then when we come to give research, it's more, more likely to be received. It's essential to get civil society buy-in. If, if, if work is only coming from academia, and speaking to policymakers, it has very little impact. But if you have civil society coming with the same, the same voice and the same messages, it's more likely to be impactful. And one of the things we've tested um, is including local officials actually within the research process, even doing data collection with us. Because that might help to shift some of the, the stuck mindsets that are there. So I see I've still got eight minutes to talk and I've, I've whistled through, so we'll have some time for questions. But I think the conclusions are simply this. We have new challenges. Those are desperately going to require new approaches. I've put on the table a few ways in which we're thinking about it, but I think there are lots of other opportunities in the room to, to hear some other ways. And there's new opportunities arriving. You know, we've got the SDGs coming online. We know they're not per perfect by far. SDG 2 doesn't talk about cities. SDG 11, the urban one, doesn't talk about food. How do we bridge those gaps? But at least there's some opportunity to, to embed some new thinking in there. We've got the new urban agenda that's finally talking about food. First major urban document to do that. How do we make sure those opportunities are, are harnessed? In Africa, we have the decentralization of, of national government to local government, providing new opportunities, new mandates. How do we build on those things? And given all these new opportunities, are we generating a new generation of scholars who are able to, to respond to these challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I, I think this is an important way to start thinking beyond, as most people here are coming from an, an agricultural background, about producing more food. Uh, if soon 50% of the world population uh, is living in urban areas, we have to be dealing with these, these, these issues and not just thinking in simple terms, as has been too often the case until now. So uh, we have about 17 or 18 minutes. Uh, we started a little bit late, so I think we'll end a little bit late too. Um, we have time for questions. So there are four microphones on the side of the room. If you can uh, line up at, the, at these microphones so that we can take the questions. We'll take a few questions at a time and then give the speakers uh, the opportunity to respond. Uh, I would please ask you to ask questions and not to make long commentaries. Uh, we want to give the opportunity to several people to ask questions and the speakers to respond. So if you can make brief questions, um, and I will start uh, on this side. So please introduce yourself and make your brief question. Hi, my name is Abby Hahn. I'm from Virginia Tech University. 
And I just want to ask Dr. Heron, um, if we do have this uh, agro agroecological food system that you were talking about in the future, do you see that intersecting at all with technology like robotics, artificial intelligence, um, CRISPR-Cas9, anything like that? Thank you. That's an excellent example on how to ask a short question. So we'll take one question on that side. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hugo Melgar Quiñones, uh, McGill University in Canada. My question is for Professor Battersby. Uh, you alluded to the role of uh, civil society. I was wondering in your experience, uh, what's the role or, of civil uh, organizations uh, in this? We'll take a question in the back there. Uh, yes, my name is Shona Candy from the University of Melbourne in Australia. I have a question for Jane Buttersby um, about embedding researchers in, uh, in civil society, something we've tried. But one of the main challenges was um, time frames. How do you deal with the different time, chains, time <coughs> frames for research and for civil society focus or projects? Okay, I'll take one more. Uh, I'm Aino Olawole Emanuel from Sefako Mahato Sciences University. My question is about the organic uh, agriculture. Um, considering the fact that uh, you're talking about sustainable agriculture vis-a-vis -vis sustainable environment, um, I want to know how truly is organic agriculture, uh, how safe? How safe it is? Because um, by my understanding, um, organic uh, agricultures are, pro are, are produced using organic manures, which could include uh, um, solid uh, municipal solid waste, and these municipal solid waste can actually contain uh, toxic materials like uh, disposable batteries and stuff like that, which can raise the um, metal toxicity of uh, uh, agricultural product they are used for. So, how safe is this organic uh, uh, product? Thank you. Uh, I'll pause here for the moment and uh, give the opportunity to the uh, speakers to uh, respond, and we'll take another uh, round of questions after that. So, um, who wants to begin? Jane, do you want to begin? What was the first oh. question? I didn't get the first question. Yeah. How, how to combine agroecological farming systems with some technologies like robotics, uh, etc.? Okay. Um, Working? Okay. Well, thank you for the questions, um, both about civil society, so that's, that's nice. Um, what is the role of civil society organizations? I think that there's a, there's a few. Um, you know, we're in a context where we have the right to food in the South African constitution, but it's a right that's never been tested, and that needs to come from civil society. However, oftentimes civil society don't necessarily have the, the tools to do that, and so there's a, there's a need for a researcher, academic, activist civil society interface in order to, to enable that. Um, but I think broader than that, there's a role for civil society to, to hold the state accountable to what it's, to what it's meant to be responsible for. Um, and there's also a need for civil society to hold the private sector accountable. But there's also opportunities for civil society to, to actually enact food system change. So the other project we're just starting out on is doing a largely participatory research process within a, within a single neighborhood and trying to get that community to identify where the food system challenges are and locate what it is that can be done by civil society organizations at the local scale to enact change in that neighborhood and also then how to engage local government and provincial government if necessary to enact changes that, that, that they are unable to enact themselves. So there's that kind of, again, it's, it, it's, a, it's a mix of roles. Um, I think there's probably a lot more that, that can be done from that, and I think the, the, the possibility of civil society networks across locations is also potentially very important. So we've seen a lot of that um, in place. The embedded researchers, all of our embedded researchers have been embedded at the, at the local government level or provincial government level and not in civil society. So it's a, it's a different set of challenges. But I think this question about temporal scales is, is really important because all of the actors are operating at different, different temporal scales. So we often talk about scale mismatch in terms of spatial scale, but the temporal scale is, is critically important because policymakers are working on a sort of 2030 agenda, political officials are on a, on a five-year election cycle, civil society are on a kind of urgent basis, academics are on a funding cycle. And so we do really need to, th need to think critically about how we, how we do that and whose scale takes, 
takes precedence. Um, and so, Shona, I don't, I don't have an, an answer, but I think it's a really important question for thinking about how we enact change when we are working at multiple scales. Thank you. Hans? Yeah, on the, um, the, the, uh, well, the first question on agroecology and robotics, you know, you have always to ask yourself, okay, what is the problem I need to solve? If you need, uh, I don't know, you have a problem and uh, you cannot go there and you need a drone, but why not? You know, we're not saying that this uh, agroecology is sort of against technology. But I think what we need to, to be clear is what are the issues we need to solve? And then how do we solve them in a sustainable manner so that in the longer term, your system gets better and not worse, because that's what happened so far. I mean, the, the whole agricultural, uh, the, the land gets degraded over time, so we need to work against this. And are there technologies we need? Maybe. Uh, I think we need to know more about, for example, the, the, the weather patterns, because farmers need to take, you know, be aware of maybe what seeds to use, for example, or what uh, when to plant. And so that's, uh, part of the technology, you know, which I think comes in. Um, robotics, for example, now the latest is, oh, but we don't need bees anymore, we can make m tiny bee robots, okay? So, as an example. Or first you go kill everything and then you come in with robots. And I mean, that's sort of, doesn't make much sense, right? So again, I think to me it looks like, what are the problems and then you come up with the best solution for it? A solution which is affordable, sustainable, which doesn't create a dependency, as so that's important. And so then you're going back to organic and your problem with uh, um, uh, contaminations. You see, that's why I think we have a problem trying to have a sort of parallel agriculture. We, we've seen this now, right now, a lot of cross-contamination from farmers who actually uh, are conventional versus the one organic or agroecological. And so there we need again to make sure that the transformation is not a substitution. We need a systemic change. And if you, uh, if you uh, I think you're pointing to, to contaminate manure, which goes back onto the, but you have to feed clean material to your cattle or to animals. The manure is also clean when it comes back onto the field. So I think, you know, we, 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 it's again a systemic transformation. Uh, and, and not a point and just a little thing here and then the rest we continue as, uh, as uh, before. So again, I think that's what we are calling for, you know, the paradigm change. Go away from this heavy input to actually the farm producing the necessary input. And if your farm is actually chemical free, then, then you wouldn't have all these problems. Um, I think I, I hope Thank I answered you. that question. Because Thank you. Uh, so we'll take another round of questions. Thank you for your patience there. Please ask your question. Okay, um, my name's Leon Terry from Cran Cranfield. My question is um, to Dr. Heron. You criticize big bi business. How do you think the recent um, mergers will affect your view? Thank you. Uh, I'll take one question there. Thank you. My question is to Jane, and uh, unless I got her wrong, uh, the, she said that we need to move from thinking about food security from by analyzing at the household level. But perhaps that could be okay for South Africa, but for other countries like Tanzania, where I come from, okay, I forgot to say my name. My name is Justin Rasa. I come from Sokoino University of Agriculture in Tanzania. So where I come from, if you now move from the household, we, we, we might lose the plot. Because there are a lot of vulnerable, vulnerable people in the household, the children and the women, who are in food, food insecure. So if we now start analyzing food security at the community level, we might really lose out. So perhaps it might not be good for every country to go the way you, you said thank you. Thank you. I'll take one question in the back there. Thank you. My name is Anne Motte. I work for FAO in Rome. And my question is for Dr. Ehren. Um, I would like to know uh, what is um, your idea about how we can reconciliate better climate smart agriculture and agroecology approaches. Uh, last week we had the fourth CSA conference uh, in Johannesburg where one of the most important conclusions was the contribution agroecology can make to CSA. And we also know that uh, the other way around is possible. You mentioned weather patterns and, and the impact of climate change on agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one question in the back there. My name is Feyo Tawaias from University of Cape Town. My question is for Dr. Hans. I want to know, you said that expectation of people expect cheap food to be cheap. 
However, what about the low-income people? And then based on the fact that food security is supposed to be, food is supposed to be affordable. So how do you have a win-win situation so with the expectation that farmers also have to have money, but people don't also have money to buy the food? So how do you relate with that? Okay, I think I'll take two more questions and then we'll have a last round of, of responses. Uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, Stefan Weise, Biodiversity International. Uh, my question goes to the urban food security piece. Um, and uh, the suggestion was made that we need to look beyond the household and take it one step beyond so that we can look at other levels of interventions. Um, where do you see the rural space uh, being important or less important when you look at the urban food security and how do we uh, then create the connections if that's an important piece of the answer. Thank you. And the last question for this round. I'm Judith Kimir from uh, Kenyatta University in Kenya. My question concerns the importation or uh, imports of uh, the snack foods. And I'm just wondering at what point does the people that regulate standards come in and those that formulate nutrition guidelines to regulate this uh, influx of uh, importation of snacks? Thank you. And thank you to all the people asking questions for having been so precise and so brief. Um, and it's very balanced. We have, uh, again, three questions for Hans and three questions for Jane. So. Jane, do you want to start again? Sure. Yeah, um, about the, the shifting focus from the household scale, I, I think really what I was trying to say is we need to shift focus from being entirely at the household scale, which is where I've seen it um, largely landing. Um, um, we obviously still need to focus at the household scale. The concern is that if we do that to the exclusion of other scales, we might actually end up um, allowing a series of, of things that are going to negatively affect food security happen that happen outside the household scale that we don't actually necessarily see. If that makes any sense? Um, so for example, we've seen in our context the promotion of household food gardens as the only policy entry point, and yet we've seen all these changes in the retail sector that are actively undermining food security. And so how do we maintain both of those? We also need to look at b below the household scale and look at those vulnerable individuals within households. So, so a gender focus is really important. Um, a focus on, on youth and children is really important. So it, it, it's saying we need, to, we need to hold multiple scales at the same time. And that's really the, the challenge. And of course, in that context, the, the, the rural space is, is very important. So if you look at what's in the, the new urban agenda with food, they talk about having a, a need for a territorial approach. And the city region food system is one, one approach that really tries to think seriously about those, those urban rural connections. Within that, I think we need to hold, again, that multiple jurisdictional types exist in that space. And so there is a distinct role for, for local government there is also a role for a more fluid regional governance scale that we need to think about in, in these issues. We also need to think <clears throat> a little bit beyond the rural as being the source of food and the, and the urban as being the source of consumption and think about all the multiple kinds of flows that are, that are in place. So food security is not simply about the flow of food, it's about the flow of remittances, it's about the flow of, of social capital, and again all of those have distinct rural and urban linkages that, that need, to be, need to be unpacked. Um, on the snack food and regulation, uh, that is a little bit beyond my, uh, my competence. Um, so rather than blowing bubbles, I think I'd rather leave that one. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mergers. All right, there are sort of two views on this, and uh, EPES Food has uh, published a report on uh, mega, all these mega mergers and the uh, consequences for, for everybody, the farmers and the consumers, the environment, basic for everything. Um, I will give you my view on this one. Um, it doesn't matter. We don't need them, so let them go away. That would be one, one thing I would say. Still a problem, because they get so big, they will have more money to influence our policymakers, and that's where the problem really lies. This is the big thing. There is no limit to how much money they will spend to, to, to buy up uh, uh, decision makers. Just look what happened in Europe with uh, glyphosate uh, a, few, a week ago. I mean, enormous pressure and also money under the table guaranteed. And that's the problem with those mergers. But in the end, 
I always say, you know, there are organic farmers out there, there are people doing it the natural way. So why do you need any of that stuff to begin with? And the other thing is that if we need something, then it should be localized because those products, if they are organic, they need to be adapted to local conditions and we need smaller businesses working with the farmers, if anything, to provide those input from the seeds uh, to amendments uh, as may be needed. <coughs> so I think, you know, it's a bad thing, but maybe if we were to change agriculture the way we think we should be changing it, they would become irrelevant. That's the one thing. Uh, agroecology and CSA. You see, why do we do now CSA when we have agroecology? It becomes now a, a carbon market issue so that some people continue to pollute and the farmers now are, are being given little money to put carbon in the ground. It's wrong. It's reductionist. It, it's the wrong approach to the problem. So again, I think that let's forget about this CSA thing because look who's behind it. What kind of interests are pushing that one? So let's just, I think, forget it. Yes, you know, food should be more expensive. Clearly, yeah, we have all these poor people out there who can't afford it. Who are they? There are the people living, uh, in, in, in our farmers, farmer family, and the ones who could not make a living in the countryside who have moved into the cities, and they are poor there and hungry there. So our food system is really, really in need of a change. Number one, people have to pay the true cost of food. Basta. And if we do that, you will see that people, the farmers, will actually be able to manage without the subsidies. And I think those subsidies, which amount to like almost 300 billion a year now, could be used to help the poorer segment of the population afford that food, which the price has to go up, while everything gets rebalanced. And I think we need major changes. And that is not something which is going to be done a little bit here at a time. Major changes. And I challenge a lot of the economists here, agroeconomists and others, I think, to come up with, with a way to really make this transformation. Because I think that's the key. The, if we don't have true costing in our food system, I don't think we can solve the, 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 production, the production issue behind it, the transformation issue behind it. Thank you, uh, Jane and Hans. So uh, thanks also for the uh, people uh, coming up with the, the questions. Just a few words in terms of, of conclusion. I, I think the, the case has been very strongly made to think about sustainable food systems in all its dimension, not only the economic productivity dimension, but the environmental, nutrition and health, the social and cultural dimensions, and pay equal attention to these different dimensions. I think uh, we need to really start looking at measuring what matters and rewarding what matters, things that are uh, of value to society and not just productivity increases or, or some narrow other economic metric, or even at the national level, a GDP measure, that's not what matters to people and, and to society. And therefore, we need to look beyond these dimensions of just productivity, which is still, in many cases, the dominant discourse that we hear in, in conferences like this. Um, thinking beyond just the rural dimension of agriculture in the context of sustainable food systems and bringing the, this urban uh, rural interface and, and how really to tackle this in a more integrated way I think is, is very important. And finally, I think we are not sufficiently aware of the importance of the health time bomb that we are embarked on. I mean, we heard some. Uh, IPES Food also produced a report uh, on the uh, health, on the impact of our current food systems on health, and the figures that are mentioned in there are mind-boggling. We're not talking about millions or hundreds of millions, we're talking about hundreds of billions and trillions of cost to society, and many of these figures are only based on Europe and North America because that's where the data are available, but if you look at that at, at the global level, we cannot afford to just continue to ignore that. And, and I think the role of agricultural production and the, the whole food system in our health is really extremely important and we must start integrating that in everything we do. So with that, I thank you uh, for your attention and I 
uh, suggest we give a big clap to the uh, two keynote presenters. We do not have a break now, ladies and gentlemen. We're moving directly over, but we have just concluded. <laughs>